What's up guys and welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be passing down some of my knowledge to some youngsters. I've got some teenagers here who live in Dubai who just started on their fitness journey and I'm going to take them through a session. I've actually done a session with them before, free of charge, and I'll be doing another session with them today but I'll be documenting it. So I'm just going through the very basics of executing the fundamental movements and spreading some knowledge and giving some advice on just what to do in order to build muscle, lose body fat and get ahead of the game in the whole bodybuilding thing. So let's crack on. Here are the students for the day. My name is Akash, I'm 17. I've been training my whole life. Stamina training, I started weights about one year ago now. Yeah, I'm Shish and I've been working, I've, I've been playing sports my whole life, but I've only recently started lifting weights. And the whole experience, the process, I started falling in love with it and finally meeting Mike. It's like another boost towards me lifting more. Have you guys done a flat barbell press before? Yeah. Oh yeah, I haven't lifted that heavy yet, but the exercise is like pretty useful. Yeah. I think a lot of people, when they first start doing barbell press, a lot of them will struggle to feel their pecs contracting. They usually would feel more engagement when they use a dumbbell, but today we'll give this a go and I'll teach you how to properly execute the exercise itself. So, lying flat on the bench, feet firmly positioned. I would recommend you put your little finger on the first smooth strip. You're going to push the weight up above your head. And then the first thing, I want you to just retract your scapula a little bit. So you're pulling shoulder blades back. Slight arc in your lower back as well. Grip the bar tightly and then you're going to lower the weight down. You're going to point your elbows in slightly. Bring the bar just above your sternum. And then as you press, this is the most important part, I want you to imagine you're trying to bring your hands together, okay? So your hands are not going to move because obviously friction is keeping them in place. But if you have that intention of trying to bring your hands together as you press, you'll feel a lot more engagement with the chest. And there's no need to push right at the top of the movement because when you lock out, you'll want to push forward, right? Locking out, pushing forward, it means that you'll lose the tension away from your chest, which is not what you want to do, okay? So we'll start off 10 reps. It's going to be light. The bar is 20, obviously. So first of all, bar, hands above your shoulders all the time. You're gonna pull your shoulders back slightly. Arc your lower back. Yep. You're gonna bring down slowly to your stern. And then as you push up, you're gonna bring your hands together. Feel, feel that squeeze. Yeah. And then just pause at the top. Hands in that position. Yep. Slow. Hands together. Squeeze the chest. Good. Three more. How did that feel? Uh, definitely felt my chest a lot more than normal. Yeah. I did 60, uh, I've done 60 like a couple times. Yes. My shoulders usually die. Now, 20, I can feel the chest more. Feels good. Yeah. So you guys will need to ask yourself, okay, so what's the purpose of you doing this exercise? Are you trying to train for strength to get stronger or are you trying to actually focus on building particular muscle? So with this, if your goal is to actually build up your pecs, then the goal should always be to try and maintain as much tension as possible, create it from the weight and keep it on the chest. It's, it's a very hard thing to do, particularly as the weight gets heavier because your other muscle groups want to take over and move that weight, yeah? We're not just trying to move the weight from point A to B, we're trying to think about, okay, so how are we doing it, right? And we want to try and do it as much as possible by using breathing on the way down and then exhale on the way up. Squeeze the chest. And I would press up to the point just before lockout. So, yeah. yeah. Two more. Keep the shoulders back. Good. One more. Yes, son. How'd that feel? A lot different than what I usually do. Yeah. A lot more tension up here. Yeah. And it's, this exercise can be a dangerous one if you're not using correct form. This is where a lot of shoulder injuries come about because you're protracting the shoulder. I know I've had a pretty bad left shoulder injury in the past because I was trying to lift too heavy and I was unable to keep my shoulders back and it just got pretty nasty for the rotator cuff. Okay, let's put a 10 on the inside. So I would say if you are still at the beginner phase or you still kind of get to grips with this exercise, you should not be pushing to failure. So if you're getting close to the point where you're struggling to push the weight up or even I would stop 
before that repetition. Because if you go into failure at this stage, the risk of injury is too high. Right? You guys will build muscle just by doing a decent amount of volume with a heavy weight. There's no need to push the failure at the moment. When you get stronger, when your technique gets better, when you've got a spotter, then you can push yourself a little bit more. Yeah. But the worst thing you can do is to try and push to failure when you haven't got that exercise mastered and you have that inability to keep everything fixed in place. Nine. Ten, good. So in terms of intensity, on a scale of one to ten, how difficult would you say that was oh, this week? Good, a good eight. Yeah. Seven. It's a lot more than before. Yeah. So when you're doing it with proper form, you're doing it with a slower tempo like that, yeah. with like a three second negative, this weight is enough. Yeah. yeah. So there's, at this stage, there's no need to go heavier because the form's going to get a bit shit. So you're better off just doing another three or four sets of eight to 10 reps on this weight. Usually what I would recommend, so many people go to the gym and they think, oh yeah, I'm going to do chest today. Mm -hmm. But if, if you don't have like a well-developed chest that's used to a lot of volume, if you train it properly, it's going to be very fatigued. We do like three sets on this, and then you do another three or four sets of another chest exercise. If you're doing it properly, it's going to be pretty fatigued. And you don't need to do any more volume than that. You know, what you've done just there and something else, that's going to be enough volume to stimulate muscle growth. Mm -hmm. and if you do any more, you'll just find that the repetition's quality is not going to be very good because it's going to be fatigued. Mm -hmm. And you almost, you're wasting your time a little bit. It's not the most effective way of trying to become as big as possible. At the beginning, you may as well train a couple of different muscle groups in one session. So like today, we're going to do a bit of chest, we're going to do a bit of back, and we'll do a bit of shoulders. Yeah. Right. So we're hitting three muscle groups in one session. Then obviously, because we're doing a bit of pushing, a bit of pulling, you're going to be working your biceps and triceps indirectly as well. Yeah. Once you get to the point where you are more advanced in training, you've got more years of training in the bag, then you can increase the intensity and do more volume on fewer muscle groups in a particular session. Yeah. Like the bodybuilders bit, some people yeah. go, when they're big bodybuilders, they go to the gym and just do one muscle group. But that's because they're doing such high intensity and they have to literally just destroy the muscle in order to get it even bigger than it actually is. But for someone like brand new, beginner, who doesn't have someone training them, when they do the bench press, yeah. what, do they, what should they expect to feel in the chest exactly? If they've been doing it incorrectly for years, they don't know what they should be looking out for. But that moment when they do a set correctly, and they, it just starts to switch on, all the fibers are working, and you're like, oh, this is what it should feel like. And when you know, like, you know, when I've adjusted your form, you feel like, oh, okay, this feels different. Yeah. That is what you want to try and feel every time you do those sets, right? And if, if you don't feel it, or you feel like, oh, my shoulders are tired, or my triceps are tired, then you're not doing it right, and you need to change something. Usually it's the case where you just have to lower the weight, just concentrate more, and switch your positioning. Remember what I said, imagine your pecs stretching at the bottom, yeah. come down, feel it stretch, and feel everything contract and gets closer together and squeeze. Yeah. Just keep visualizing that, that's what you want to be happening. I'm gonna do two more, okay? Keep your shoulders back, shorten the chest, good. One more. Good. And what you'll notice, like, when you're actually doing it properly, you'll start to shake. Yeah. That's not because you're getting weaker all around, that's because you're actually just trying to get your chest to do the majority of the work. And because it's not used to doing all that work by itself, you get a little bit shaky. But that's good, because it means you're doing something right. Visualization also helps a lot, because yeah. when I went inside imagining it, my chest just like closing every time. Really, really like half the time when I'm at the gym and I'm training, I'm, I'm like, I just close my eyes and I'm thinking of my body moving. Like I'm trying to get inside of my body and imagine everything like length and, and then imagine it all like contracting and squeezing together. If I was doing like, you know, those presses, but I was looking at that screen, I'd be distracted. For me, I feel like it was a wasted set. Every single repetition has to have complete and utter 100% focus. Yes, good. Very good. <laughs> That was intense. <laughs> so we'll go on to another muscle group. It wouldn't necessarily make sense to do chest again right now because I think it's, for you guys it'd be a little bit fatigued. 
So there's no harm in just doing another muscle group and then coming back to doing chest a little bit later on. Let's do lat pull down. So before you do this, I recommend you do at least one or maybe two warm-up sets of doing this movement. Remember how I told you in the last session how whenever you're rowing, you want to like stretch the lat yeah. and then you want to contract it. We're going to do the same thing here. So we're going to elevate the scapula and then depress. So you're trying to pull the weight down without bending your elbows. And that will just kind of get your mind prepared for what it is that you should be doing. Stretch at the top and then you're just going to depress like that. Relax, stretch, and then down, and then depress. So it's a short movement, but this is how you should be initiating the exercise. Stretch it out. For every single exercise you do, you want to try and initiate the movement with the working muscle. Pull down as much as possible. There we go, that's good. A lot of YouTube videos, you see people work out, then they take stuff from everywhere. They figure out the forms and everything. But like, should they follow the videos or should they do try and error, find out how to do it properly? This is what I've always done in the past, because I've watched a whole load of videos. People have their own approaches to how to execute a particular exercise or diet or training program. And what I tend to do is I'll, I'll listen to what someone has to say. Maybe I'll go and try it out for myself. If it doesn't work, I don't really feel it, and I'm like, oh, maybe that's not for me. And then I'll maybe listen to somebody else and see what they have to say. So what I've learned over the past like 12, 13 years, I've listened to what so many different type of people have said, a lot of experts in the field. I've tried it all, and then I've made my own judgments and figured out what has worked best for me. Because in reality, sometimes people need to have different approaches. Maybe the fun fundamentals are the same, but the way you tackle it might be different for some people. But I think the problem is, especially now, there's an abundance of information out there on YouTube. Not everyone is saying the right thing. Like there's a, a, there's a hell of a lot of personal trainers out there and a lot of them should be personal trainers, which is not qualified enough. Some of them might be getting their clients, especially some guys, to be eating less than 1,800 calories. Right, that's just not enough food. And I think that's bad advice. Or they will just not educate the client how to properly execute a particular movement. They just tell them to try and lift as heavy as possible. It is hard. It's hard to know who you should listen to and who you should trust. In my opinion, there's a few good, very good coaches out there. They tend to be older because they've got the experience. I never really would ever take advice from someone who's in their early 20s because they just, they don't have that experience under their belt. You know, I didn't start my YouTube until I was like 20, 26, 27 because I'd had three to four years of training clients, like six, seven clients every single day. So I was actually like, okay, I've got thousands of hours worth of experience. Now I can actually talk about it. Yeah. But if I hadn't coached those clients in the first place, I wouldn't have the right to talk about things which I don't understand, you know what I mean? So it's a tough one. You just have to take everything with a pinch of salt, try it for yourself, and then come to your own conclusions. Who do you watch? Oh, just a bunch of people. The Larry Wheels, um, you, the guy called Matt does fitness. <laughs> don't, like, don't, do not get advice from that guy. Worst, worst guy in the fitness <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Good, nice. I would say some of the top guys who I've probably learned the most from, yeah. Ben Pekulski, Canadian guy. Yeah. Like, he taught me a lot about form. I think it's Joe Bennett, hypertrophy coach. He's very good. Uh, John Meadows, Mountain Dog, that's like his nickname. I'm always a fan of those coaches who talk more about execution because I have no issues pushing myself and sticking to a plan. I think if you can go into the gym, execute exercises properly and just train hard, that will make a huge amount of difference. Whether, whether than like trying to like sit down and worry about like, oh, should I do like 11 reps or should I do 12 reps? Or should I do like bench press first? Or should I do like bent over row first? Like, a lot of people tend to worry about like things which aren't really gonna make a huge amount of difference. Yeah. You know, I would worry about getting your form right and actually pushing yourself and focusing and training with like, the most amount of intensity possible. So now we're going to do that same thing. You'll initiate by pulling down, and then once you've depressed the scapula, you're going to follow through with your elbows and come to this point. So you're not trying to bring it all the way down to your chest. Yeah. 
is you'll internally rotate your shoulders. You end up in this position, right? If you do that, you strain your shoulders and you lose the tension from your back. Yeah. Okay, so elbows should always be underneath your hands. I would say this attachment just by your chin and you're ending up in this position. Okay, so if you, again, my back is like fully contracted in this position. And I'm gonna slowly lower the weight up, stretch the lat, and then same thing, depress, drive down, and pinch. I'd recommend just pausing at the bottom a little bit. For me, I like to put my thumb around any attachment which I'm using for a rowing movement. Okay, so for me, I find as though, like, if I'm grabbing something tight, I will automatically start to feel my bicep engage a little bit more. And when I pull, it's, it's not a massive difference, but I do feel a little bit more tension on my bicep. So I just try and use my hand as a hook, or sometimes I'll use wrist straps, so that I can really just take my lap to failure without having to worry about gripping onto the attachment too much. So yeah, I'd recommend just doing it like that. Yes. Good. <laughs> Another thing, like for new people in the gym, when they're grabbing stuff and pulling a lot, they might like you know feel skin tear, calluses, all of oh, that. Yeah. Is there any way to like reduce that or avoid that at all? Not really. You can wear gloves, but then if you wear gloves, you risk getting abused by all of your friends and everyone else in the gym, <laughs> which happened to me. My first like when I first got into training, I used to wear these leather gloves, yeah. and I loved it because my hands were so soft. But then as soon as Instagram started to get popular, I was posting pictures with my leather gloves and everybody just abused me. So I just, I took them off and yeah, your skin just starts to rip. Like if you feel mine, they're, yeah, they're, they're pretty hard. Jesus. It's not, it, it tends to be from the pulling movements and pull-ups, but it's just something which, it's if you are a lifter, you go to the gym, it's gonna you'll, you'll be able to feel it. That's the thing, whenever I start to feel another muscle group working and taking over like, oh, my biceps start to burn now, yeah. then I just try and switch them off. Just think differently about how I'm performing the movement. It's difficult, mm. but your body always wants to go through the path of least resistance. So it wants to do what's easiest, but we're not trying to make this exercise easy. Whatever exercise it is, you keep your body fixed in place and you're just trying to use one muscle to move that weight. It's gonna suck, it's gonna be hard. Your body's gonna be like, actually, no, let's just start getting other muscle groups to help us move it. And you're like, no, like, we're gonna keep them switched off. We're just gonna keep all of one muscle. So it's tough. You have to have a lot of discipline whenever you're doing all these sets of reps. That's what people always say so many times, like, oh, how can we always do the reps so slow? I'm like, why do you, what, like, why do you do it faster? And I just say to them, when I'm doing it slower, I have more time to think about what's going on. I have more control. Yeah. I notice that whenever I'm like speeding the reps up, uh, because I'm training with someone who does fast reps, it's harder for me to keep the tension on the working muscle. It's, pretty yeah, it's just like everything is just all over the place. I lose that control. So I always want to keep that control. And I find as well, like if I'm doing it a little bit slower, obviously the, the time that you're working under tension is going to be a, a lot longer. Yeah. So sometimes if you're doing a really slow negative, you can double the amount of time in which you're performing a certain exercise. I'd always recommend doing it on the slower side. If you're going for power, then obviously you're going to be more like explosive. But we're not we're not training for power here. We're training for mass. Yeah. Working harder on that. What pro what should they look for, and what should they like? You know, how much should you take in? So I, I always go by this rule of setting your protein intake to be around 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. So. What are you weighing at the moment? 69. So 69. You'd want to have like maybe 160 grams of protein. That's good going. Yeah. And ideally, this is what I always say, try to get the majority of your food and your nutrients from whole food, right? Not like processed things like bars, sweets. Food which is in its natural state, like meat, fish, eggs, vegetables, rice, potatoes, things like that. Protein powders can help to get you to that target. So if you're the type of person who really like to eat that much food, or maybe you do, but the protein portion per meal is pretty low, and you were, let's say for example, you were 40 grams short of protein for the day, then you can have a protein shake yeah. Yeah, to get you to that level. But like, I could stop having protein shakes and my body's really not gonna change. I just have protein shakes because it's just an easy way for me to hit 210 grams of protein, which I need to have. So I'd recommend any good brand, honestly. Um, but if you are a type of person that's like, maybe you have some issues with digesting 
dairy, or maybe some of the products have quite a lot of sweetness and chemicals in them that can give you bad skin, that can cause you to bloat or give you gas, which I know has happened to me when I would have whey protein. So I have vegan protein. So that's basically plant-based protein powder. So it's like usually a combination of like rice, pea, and hemp protein all in one. So it gives you a complete amino acid chain profile. So there's a few good ones from my protein which offer that. But ultimately it's just what you can get your hands on. And raw eggs? They don't need to be raw. Like, you don't need to punish yourself and have raw eggs. You, you, know, you might as well just make yourself a nice omelette. A lot of times as well, you might, if you might get a dodgy egg, that's gonna really mess your stomach up. So you don't have to be chugging raw eggs. Now we're gonna do incline dumbbell press. This is probably one of the most difficult pressing exercises because a lot of the time, people will let their front delts take over. But secondly as well, because we're trying to target the upper pec, there's not a huge amount of upper pec fibers here, especially compared to your mid pec and lower pec. That's where the majority of the fibers are. Yeah. So if you want to get like a bigger chest, I would spend more of your time doing exercises which are hitting these fibers. So decline pressing, flat pressing. But if you notice that, okay, you, you built up a decent chest, you want to start to grow more of your upper chest, that's when you need to be doing more incline pressing work or incline flies. And it's a little bit more difficult, like I said, so really we don't need to be lifting too heavy. Okay, and again, you know what I said? How you should know when it starts to work. You'd be like, oh, okay, I can feel it switching on, I can feel it firing. That's what we want to try and go for. So, start off, dumbbells above your chest. You're just gonna pull back and push your chest out a little bit. What I recommend, this is what some people say, oh, don't bring your elbows too wide because you are putting yourself in a dangerous, dangerous position for your shoulders, which is, it has truth to it, but that's only when you, when you are lifting really heavy weight. So if you want to protect yourself a little bit, you can bring your elbows in a little bit. But the problem is if you bring your elbows in too much and you end up doing that, because of the position at which you're pressing, you're engaging more of your front delts triceps. So we want to bring the elbow out a little bit more so we can try and target these fibers because the pec fibers are running in this position. Okay, if we want to switch these ones on, then we really need to contract and stretch, contract and stretch. If we do that, it's yeah. more on this alignment. So it's front delt tricep. You get a bit of chest, but for me, this is the best position to be. Slowly you're gonna go down. Come to about this position where you're at 90 degrees, you feel a good stretch. And then the most important part, you're gonna press up, but instead of thinking about pushing the dumbbells up, think about bringing the elbows together. So elbows together, nice and slow. And when I do that, it's giving myself time to think about, oh, okay, yeah, all the pec fibers in my upper chest are shortening. And when I come to the top, I'm squeezing everything together. But I'm not like, I'm not coming to the point where I'm banging the dumbbells together. I'm trying to bring my elbows together. So that top position, elbows together. If you come here, you feel my chest, right? Stretched in this position, you come and feel my other chest. These are, this is where all the fibers are. We're gonna go up and then squeeze, yeah? So that's, that's what you wanna feel. And you can make a light weight really hard. Down to the side, hands up above elbows. Now we're going to feel all here. Keep it above chest. Nice and slow. Even slower than that, even on the way up, I want to twice. Squeeze. Feel it? Yep. All here. Don't put your hands too far forward like that. You still want to keep it above your shoulder. Yeah. You want to come out of these sets just like, not only are you fatigued physically, but it's the mental fatigue from trying to concentrate yeah. like so much throughout that entire set. So what you'll notice as you progress through the set, as you fatigue, naturally your shoulders will start creeping forward because that's your body just being like, well, no, we don't want the chest to do the work, let the shoulders do the work instead. So if you feel it happening, when you come up to the top, just reset, pull back and get into position again. Every time you push your shoulders back, it's like the chest just dies. Yeah. Every time you can push it, it's like there's no strength left at all. Yeah. That really... And that's why, like, if you feel like, oh my, I can't even do like 10 reps, slow the weight. 
you'll notice very quickly over time you'll get stronger but if it means that you have to start from the beginning again so be it don't let your shoulders come forward keeping them back keeping them back two that's one good I learned the most about my own form and technique the moment I started filming myself because I saw myself working from different angles. You know, you can't always see yourself in the mirror. If you get someone to film it, you're like, oh, you're either not doing the movement correctly or there's one side which is doing more than the other. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's the case that you're going to start to notice imbalances in mass compared to the left and the right. The best room can be your best room. Come on, come on, please, 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 please. Yeah. I would imagine you guys aren't following any particular program at the moment. No. Okay. So I would highly advise that if you're starting off and going to the gym, you have some program to stick to. Okay, because it's very easy just to come in here and be like, oh, I'll do a bit of this, do a bit of that. And you don't really know if you're doing the right things. There's no way of you tracking the weight which you're lifting. And you're not necessarily effectively overloading the muscle each time okay, with heavier weight, heavier resistance. Because let's say, for example, if we went and we did lat pull down again in a week's time, you'd be like, oh, actually, I don't really remember what I lifted last time. So if you get to the habit of writing down what you lifted and trying to improve upon that, that's a very good way to get bigger because you're overloading the muscle with more stress. Instead of you being a beginner and going straight into like a bodybuilding split, my recommendation would be just to try and focus on covering the fundamentals, doing the basic compound movements, some pressing, some pulling, pull downs, squatting movements, deadlifts, whatever it might be, and not really doing a huge amount of different exercises. Maybe you're only doing like eight to 10 exercises throughout the whole week, but you're repeating them a number of times in one week. So you're doing more practice, more repetition with the same movement. It's gonna give you a higher chance of you getting better at performing that exercise instead of you trying to do 30 different exercises in one week because you're trying to teach yourself so many different movements and you're not repeating them as often as you would do if you were doing less movements. It's better to select a few exercises and just get very good at executing them. This is the thing, like, so if you went to the gym and you just trained chest, your chest is probably gonna be really sore, which means you probably won't be able to train chest again for a good few days until the soreness is gone. Whereas if you trained a number of different muscle groups in one session, you did less volume on your chest, you'd still be applying sufficient volume in order for it to grow. But because you haven't overdone it, your chest is gonna recover quicker, which means you can train it again. So what do you think is gonna be more effective for you to grow your chest? Training it really intense once a week or training it intense three times a week. Now this one is more challenging because you have to get your entire torso fixed in place, right? And your posture sorted out. You need to neutralize your spine. A lot of people when they do a bent over row, they'll perform it like this, where their, their back is rounded. So if you look at my lower back, it's like all messed up. And then they're just not retracting the scapula and they're over-engaging their bicep, but then after they've just said, like, oh my God, my back and my bicep, it's just like, that's not what we want to do. So most important thing, when it comes to doing a squat, deadlift, bent over row, you need to get yourself into this position, okay? So in this position, this is what you call neutralizing your spine, okay? Your spine is bent, and then you neutralize it, so everything is straight, okay? So naturally, when I'm in this position, I feel a pull on my hamstrings, my spine is straight, but I'm in a very strong position to lift weight, whether I'm pulling it, rowing it, or squatting down with it, yeah? So let's see first of all if you guys can do it. Ben, you need to look at more. You want to feel a slight pull on your hamstring? Yeah. Good. Completely flat. This is what we want. And whenever you're doing a deadlift row or, squ or squat, head should be aligned with the torso. So don't look up, you're just looking down from the floor. Yeah? You don't want to be at a point where you're like, that. Okay, that's not good for you now. Okay? So everything straight. Your turn. Bend over a tiny bit more. Good. So again, everything is straight. So you're almost imagining you're pushing this part of your back inwards a little bit. Yeah? You'll generally be in a safer position once you can do that. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like this is what I think when I'm getting to that position. I'm bending over and I'm just like sticking my ass out of it, I'm like tilting my hips. So when you tilt the hips, pull the hamstrings, but I'm in a very strong position to handle a lot of weight. So now I'm going to do bent over row. Now either you can do pronated grip, which is like that, or supinated. Neither is superior to the other. What I tend to do is mix it up from time to time. You'll notice if you do supinated, 
like this, you'll find more forearm and bicep engagement because of the fact that you're gripping the bar like this when you're rowing in this kind of position. Yeah? Yeah. But you should mostly feel it in your lats, particularly your lower lats. So I would do the thing where I put my thumbs around the bar, same position, just rowing it in to like my belly button. Coming up and squeeze. Yeah. And honestly, we'll probably just use the bar today because that's what we use a massive technique. This is already 20 kilograms, which is quite a lot. So we'll start off. Well, first of all, grab the bar, get back into the position you're going to be in. How far? Shoulder width apart, both times. Thumbs over. Step back. Get into the proper position. So you're sort of depressing, allowing your shoulders to relax. So you're stretching everything out. Then you're going to rope up to your belly button. There we go. Good. Everything together at the top. Good one more. Nice. Set. That was good. If you wanted to feel it more lower down, then it'd be the case you just change the angle of your torso. You just bend over even more. Be in this position. Yeah. So, so the higher up you are, the same example if I was just going to row like that, it'd be much more upper back. Right. Trap in rear delt focus by leaning forward more of the mid back. So it's really up to you, like which area of your back you want to target. But you will notice that the heavier the weight gets, the harder it is for you to maintain this position. Yeah. Yeah. And you might actually be better off just using a machine or performing it on a bench because you don't want your core to start to yeah. give away before your back does. But this is a really good exercise to help strengthen your core. Like you said before, you want to work with your lower back. Yeah. This naturally is going to work with the lower back because you have to maintain this position. Yeah. I don't really recommend too early on you start using straps, but that can help if, you're, if your forearms are in agony. You, just, you can't really grip anything anymore. But when you have the straps, they basically act as the grip, as the hook. So all you need to think about is just rowing. Rest in the balls between the working sets. Generally speaking, because, because you're not training for strength, you don't need to be resting for like three to five minutes. Usually anywhere between 60 seconds to two minutes is good. What I always tend to say now, because I'm not so religious with being like, okay, it needs to be like 90 seconds in between. I usually rest as long as I need to so that I can match or improve upon the previous set's intensity. So basically I've, I've recovered, I've got my breath back, and I'm like, yep, okay, I'm ready to go again. And that's something which, the more that you train, you can kind of gauge it. Like, because I've, been, I've done tens of thousands of reps in sets, I'm like, okay, yeah, I know, like, I'm good to go again. As early as you can do, start learning about what is in the food that you're eating. Tracking calories, basically. Okay, whenever you're making a meal for yourself, actually get to know, okay, well, how much protein is in it? How much carbs is in this? Fats. Start totaling it all up. You can use apps like MyFitnessPal, start inputting the data, and then you'll start to notice like trends and patterns, like how many calories you eat on a day-to-day -day basis, how much protein, carbs, fats. So once you start to know that, you learn more about food, and then you'll actually think, okay, maybe I need to be eating more protein. Maybe I need to be eating more, more or less calories. A lot of the time, if you're just starting out, going to the gym, it's more than often the case you just need to be eating more calories. Okay, if you want to build muscle, you want to gain weight, you need to be in a calorie surplus. Not a huge one, you don't need to be stuffing your face, but just be in enough of a surplus, maybe 200, 250 calories, to allow growth to occur. So as I said last week, a good benchmark to aim for is a, on average, gaining around two kilograms a week. Maybe if you're a beginner, you could add more weight, but if you're adding too much weight, okay, it's not gonna be pure muscle. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, if they're adding like a kilogram in two weeks time, it's like, okay, a lot of that's probably come from body fat. If you keep doing it, you'll get bigger, but you're gonna get fatter, faster than the rate, you'll get bigger. It's a very gradual process. And I think a lot of people, they, they rush too much. They already start going to the gym 17, 18 year, years old, and they wanna look like somebody who's 25 or 30. Like someone who started, they're like, oh, I wanna look like you, Mike. They need to understand that I've been doing this for like 12, 13 years. And you just have to be very patient and just learn to enjoy the process. It, is, it will happen, but you just have to be patient and figure out a way that you can enjoy it. And stay consistent. And yeah, be consistent. Consistency is the key. There's so many people that come to me that have like six months off, or they haven't gone to the gym for a year. And I'm like, if you actually want to build a dis decent amount of muscle, you need to be chipping away at it every single week. 
not every day, but like at least a couple times a week, every week. Three times a week, you're gonna see good change. Four times a week, maybe a little bit better, but quality over quantity. It's much better to have three really good sessions as opposed to five average sessions. Like you guys at the moment, do you have any idea how many calories you're consuming? <laughs> Two and a half. Two and a half, yeah. So again, that's, that's okay but you need to start observing how your body is changing. If your weight is staying the same, you're not getting any bigger, then okay, maybe bring it to 2,750. But you can be flexible with the approach. You don't have to be so strict. Like so too many people are either just like, just not strict at all, or they're too strict, they go to the extremes. Let's say for example, there was five days of the week where you were eating really clean food and you hit your macro targets. Yeah. If there was two days of the week where you just kind of, you were eating what you wanted to, that's not too bad. It's not gonna be the end of the world. So uh, you don't need to stress out too much. But it's just if you're trying to lose body fat, okay, and you are quite fat, yeah. maybe don't have so many cheat meals. Maybe be a little bit more strict with tracking everything. But you guys at the moment, you're on the leaner side. So you don't need to be doing excess cardio or cutting too many calories. You just need to be focusing on eating enough to allow muscle growth to occur. And you'll notice once you have more muscle mass, your metabolism is gonna increase. So you'll just burn more calories from doing nothing because you have more muscle. So you'll notice at this stage, there's gonna be an improvement in the overall body composition. So the muscle mass will increase and even you know, body fat might decrease as well. Particularly for you, you said you got a bit around your stomach. If you just start to notice more muscle mass going to your legs, your arms, your upper body, I think you'll, you'll notice that puppy fat will start to spit. What are you, 17? Yeah. yeah. That'll go in a couple of years. I hope you both enjoyed it. Did loved you enjoy it? it? Loved it. It was more intense than the last one. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. the, the last one was more <laughs> a lot more talk, but this was like an actual proper routine. So that was like just an example of a body routine from the first app. So if you guys haven't copped it yet, I highly advise that you invest. Lots of good routines for beginners. So I'd recommend if you were on the first app, you do some of the full body routines or the upper lower splits where you're hitting at least four muscle groups in a session three to four times a week. Have you got uh, Instagram pages which you want to plug? No, I just want to shout out two friends of mine, Jad and Mark. Sorry I couldn't be here. <laughs> Miss you guys. Do you yeah, want to shout out Same, man. <laughs> You're going to make it. Sweet. So thanks for watching. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next video.